In my last video, I attempted to explain away some of the myths American conservatives have come to believe. Like most people, conservatives pick pretty selectively from history to prove their points. They'll tell you slavery is no longer relevant in the U.S. because it's over. It ended a century and a half ago, so why are we even still talking about it? I find a lot of the people who say that are actually pretty enamored with Confederate symbols, so it's pretty ironic that they're clinging to one part of history that's associated with slavery, while they tell black people to get over this enormous historical injustice from the same time. But history doesn't die that easily. It leaves its legacy. Slavery has had a huge impact on the history of the U.S., and it can't be ignored. In fact, the more you learn about slavery, the more relevant it seems. So let's talk about the lasting effects of slavery. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Let's start by talking about racism. Racism originated with the transatlantic slave trade. Now that's not to say that there's only ever been one kind of racism, and, and that's the only time there's ever been racism, but racism as it exists today cannot be separated from its history. It's not universal. It's not an accident. It's not natural. It's learned. And it's learned because of the legacies of European imperialism and colonialism. The rich Europeans who wanted slaves naturally had an interest in pretending Africans were inferior, maybe not even human, as they would therefore be unworthy of respect, freedom, or justice. They eventually came up with all kinds of pseudoscience, like phrenology, to, le to lend a kind of scientific veneer to their racism. And being so obviously fake, phrenology was eventually abandoned, but racial pseudoscience is still around. We may have gotten rid of phrenology, but IQ testing was started for racist purposes, and books like The Bell Curve, again, making racism look scientific, have helped carry scientific racism into the 21st century. There was even a big eugenics movement in the U.S. before World War II. The Nazis got most of their ideas from the U.S. You can learn about that. I've put links in the description. During slavery, they also needed soldiers, slave catchers, plantation hands, and so on to make sure the slaves and the whole slave society structure remained in place. So not only the elites were made to believe in slavery and racism, the whole white population would be made to feel superior to others, thus making them willing to help with slavery or at least turn a blind eye to it. They were encouraged to blame their problems on black people instead of placing the blame with the ruling class where it so obviously belonged. The practice of that still exists as white people focus on the very, very vague concept of crime instead of looking at the systems they live under and who benefits from them. And of course, the so-called Indians they found in the Americas, as well as the Arabs, Asians, and whatever other groups they met on their adventures of conquest, could also be subjugated if judged inferior. So racism was and is integral to the success of the colonial project we call the United States of America. When you look at where modern racism came from, you realize it is necessarily white supremacy. It's a system, not an individual flaw. It needs to be approached as a system, a cultural, political, and economic phenomenon that privileges white people whether they want it to or not. Those privileges have, in part, been spelled out in court cases over hundreds of years that have separated and elevated whites over other people, uh, uh, people of other colors, let's say, and practices like poll taxes, redlining, sundown towns, 
race riots, and forming hooded militias ensured white people had the best land and all the money. And none of the five or six civil rights acts ever stopped them. Do you know the history of where you're from? At this point, conservatives usually point out, but lots of different people own slaves over history. Every kind of person has been enslaved at some point. So, you know, we can just ignore the enslavement of Africans and recent history. But a lot of historical slavery has no more relevance today. Probably all the earliest states or proto-states started as slave states. But those states no longer exist. Like Babylon. We going back to Babylon anytime soon? And the people who benefited from that slavery and the people who descended from those slaves are impossible to identify. The same cannot be said for the U.S., where the descendants of slaves are still there, still considered different, still widely discriminated against, and in fact still widely enslaved. There are more black men in chains now, working for corporations who outsource to prison slavery, than there were enslaved in 1850. That's because slavery was never really abolished. The 13th Amendment only outlawed slavery if not for a punishment. So any government that was controlled by white supremacists, so state and federal, passed a raft of new laws during the Jim Crow era, well, that's what Jim Crow was, that they could use to lock up as many black people as they could. Look at jaywalking. Jaywalking became a crime so police could target black people, and they still use it for that. Or the criminalization of drugs, more relevant today, which has several purposes, which I talked about in, uh, a couple of weeks ago, but which include filling up prisons with black and brown people and using them as slaves. It's no good saying the law treats everyone equally because it very clearly doesn't. All the institutions of the state are institutions of a white settler state. The fight against racism is necessarily the fight against the state. So police are more likely to stop you if you're black and not just obviously white. They're more likely to escalate things and use force, including deadly force. Shit, even white mass shooters get taken in unharmed, while unarmed black people get shot. Racially diverse police forces make no difference whatsoever. Judges and juries are more likely to put black, brown, and indigenous defendants in jail and for longer sentences than white defendants. Prosecutors are more likely to push for harsher convictions and they're more likely to get them because so many people who work for the state are eager to watch it destroy yet another black person's life. And because racism is such an important legacy of slavery, it's not much of an argument to say Irish people were slaves too. First, there were differences in how Irish and black slaves were treated. You could easily read about that. 82 Irish scholars have signed a letter saying the Irish weren't slaves. So you might want to read that at least if you've ever thought the two forms of labor were the same. One difference is the Irish weren't permanently separated from their families. I can't imagine the, the crushing psychological effects of kids being ripped away from their parents and brought up by the people who owned them. And the lasting effects of it happening generation after generation for hundreds of years. And that continues to this day, by the way, as children are still being separated from their parents at the border and locked in cages indefinitely. Slavers felt no guilt about separating parents from kids, and ICE feels no guilt about it today. That's not because of racism. Come on. Moreover, while the Irish in the U.S. were treated poorly for a while, today the descendants of Irish workers are white. 
so they have the same privileges all whites get. Instead of criticizing and silencing people for bringing up slavery or trying to derail the conversation by comparing it to indentured servitude, we should probably sympathize with all of history's victims and understand why things still aren't that great for them. The history of the U.S. isn't one of slavery, but then happiness and freedom for all black people. It's bad enough that slaves weren't given the land that they had worked on their entire lives. Slavery was followed by sharecropping, segregation, eugenics, lynchings, bombings, hoses, dogs, incarceration, including carceral slavery. And at every, ta every stage, being mocked and, and insulted and attacked for their wretchedness. When they got some land, segregation took it away. When they made a bit of money, it was taken from them, like the millions of dollars in black people's wealth wiped out by Freedman's Bank, or when rioting white people uh, destroyed so-called Black Wall Street in Tulsa. Then black folks get called lazy for not having money. Can you imagine how infuriating that must be? Whenever they say they're owed reparations, which obviously they are, they get laughed at. And when they point out the disparities in laws and how they're applied, they get told, you're wrong. The law doesn't discriminate. It's not a racist system. Which, of course, erases hundreds of years of history proving otherwise. There's no black equivalent of the KKK, either. White people have repeatedly terrorized black people into submission and then immediately forgot they did anything. Tulsa race riots? I don't know what you mean, but I wasn't there. Get over it. They won't let black people get angry, either. No matter how much white people make them suffer, they're told to calm down and be quiet and turn the other cheek. When they've tried to fight back, it was considered proof that blacks are inherently violent, untrustworthy, and just unworthy of freedom. Mm. The same is true today. Look at how the media and conservatives talk about Colin Kaepernick, for example, for taking a knee against police murder. They never listened to him. They never even tried. They say things like, he's disrespecting the troops. How? No, you just refuse to listen. And they're sharing memes now about how it's just fine to ram your car into protests. And as a result, dozens of peaceful protests have been attacked by cars. But they'll just laugh if you accuse them of being racist. They deflect the words, Black Lives Matter by saying, yeah, but what about black-on-black -black crime? As if that was relevant somehow. And tell people to shut up by saying, no, all lives matter. Some, some actually call peaceful protesters being attacked by police and white supremacists terrorists. See... In the U.S., it's not terrorism to terrorize people over hundreds of years. That's just how you build a country. But when marginalized people say they too are worthy of respect, they're challenging the whole nature of the state. And those are the people we call terrorists nowadays. White Americans have always been unwilling to acknowledge real problems in the U.S., they seem to have no idea, for example, that they are not free. There are laws restricting their every behavior and police or other security forces breathing down their necks at every turn, but we are free because we've been told we're free. By the way, you know the police in many parts of the U.S. grew out of runaway slave patrols, right? Racism is another thing white Americans have trouble seeing. And I understand that because I'm white, and as such, I have never experienced racism. But I've never experienced war, either. Doesn't mean millions of people aren't dying from it. 
most conservatives will actually deny there's much racism against people of color in the U.S. to the incredible extent that they believe white people are the real victims. But that's what happens when you get your information from other racists and not from actual victims of racism. You might think because you saw a video of some angry black people saying something to whites, that means that all whites are going to get killed. You might have seen countless stories of black people committing crimes and very few of white people doing it. You may just take it for granted that people who kill black civilians, uh, sorry, police, or, or whoever people who kill black civilians, were acting in self-defense. For sure, that's the excuse they gave. White conservatives rarely acknowledge any racism by any white people, but revel in pointing out people they call race baiters, like uh, Al Sharpton, who they seem to think is the king of angry black people. Neither, apparently, can any white American account for the many right-wing militias that exist largely, maybe solely, for the purpose of starting a race war. There are, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, there's about a thousand of these groups all over the country, but apparently no one belongs to them, and no one's a racist. There are, there are other legacies of slavery besides racism and its effects. For one, slavery in the U.S. and all of the American continent was integral to the development of capitalism. It fueled the Industrial Revolution. Uh, if the world were fair, of course, the descendants of the enslaved people would have acquired that wealth. But freed slaves were given nothing, and so their descendants get nothing. Slavery created a huge amount of wealth for rich white people that has, to a great extent, been passed down to current generations of rich white people. You know, those people who say capitalism rewards you for working hard. There are dozens of books on this topic you can read. Capitalism and Slavery, for example. The wealth created by the slave economy wasn't concentrated in the South, either. There were plenty of people ready to sell slaves or the products of slaves and get rich in northern cities like New York or Boston. The riches they took filled up banks and funded factories, and not just in the U.S. And many of the so-called Enlightenment thinkers of the time were in favor of slavery and capitalism and saw racism as natural. There are writers today who consider themselves children of the Enlightenment and, unsurprisingly, they're in favor of capitalism and brush off slavery and racism as incidental to it. That's because they're already ideologically committed to capitalism, but slavery and racism are bad, so they ignore or downplay those unpleasant aspects of history. But pretending the Enlightenment was one thing, but not the other, makes for incomplete and misleading history. In fact, I would go so far as to say slavery is still integral to capitalism, as there are an estimated 40 million slaves around the world making our food, clothes, electronics, and pornography, all contributing to the global economy. What about wars? The Civil War was not the only one fought over slavery. Nor is it the only war whose causes have been virtually erased in history lessons. Many of the U.S.'s wars that took place during slavery were demanded by slave owners who wanted to expand the legal territory for owning and catching slaves. The British helped thousands of slaves escape during the War of 1812. Slavery was threatened in East Texas by Mexico, so the U.S. started a war with Mexico to expand the number of slave states. Countless wars on native tribes meant expanding the U.S.'s territory and was often related to slavery, too. 
such as the Seminole Wars that ended up annexing Florida. Slavers wanted more territory, so the U.S. went to war. Slavers wanted to catch runaway slaves, so the U.S. went to war. Every time, it killed black and indigenous people and expanded its territory. It should be obvious that the effect of these wars has lasted to the present, as, like all countries, war and conquest has given the U.S. the territory it has today. But these wars are also still relevant because the U.S. is still making war all over the world. People used to profit off war then, and they continue to do so today. Profit was usually the reason for the U.S.'s wars, just like today. Once the U.S. had finished expanding across the continent, it went into East Asia and the Caribbean and started conquering territory overseas. It now reserves the right to make war anywhere in the world on whatever the flimsiest pretexts, like invading Afghanistan and Iraq and killing a million people because of a terrorist attack. And they kill as many brown people as they like. A white supremacist state is not necessarily a genocidal one. It's one where uh, it's one that can make war on non-whites for the wealth and power of its elite, and its white subjects couldn't care less about the wars or even encourage them, because mostly just brown people are dying. It's clear that the legacy of slavery is still alive. Descendants of slaves are treated as criminals to be jailed and re-enslaved or mocked and attacked whenever they tried to shed light on their condition. The territory gained through wars for slavery remains part of the state. The contempt for non-whites is present in political discourse, though it's mostly covered up by dog whistles. And when confronted with evidence of racism, privileged white people dismiss it I'm not racist, they say, as if that's the end of the discussion. They need to acknowledge the past or else continue to let it bubble just under the surface. It's not because you're white that you're the problem, but because you've internalized the values of a white supremacist state. You learn to think one way, but fortunately, you can unlearn, just like I did. There's no point in blaming any individual, living white person, for how bad things are. White people shouldn't feel guilty, but angry. They shouldn't feel helpless because of history, but stirred into action by the present. You could start by educating yourself, mostly by reading and listening. You could learn about and point out the racist nature and, and history of the political institutions and the economy. You could call out racism among people you know. And don't be a fair-weather ally, only an ally when black people are nice to you. Black people have already been amazingly patient, explaining their problems and why their lives matter. How much longer do they have to suffer before white people listen? And, and not just listen a little and then change the logo on their product, but listen to everything and stand in solidarity with those who want to tear down all the systems that are oppressing them. People are still trying to divide us, including rich people giving money to far-right racist militias and their media outlets. We should unite against the dividers. History doesn't really die. It gets covered up and denied and rewritten, but it lives on in some form. It's important to understand how it affects the present so we aren't blinded by our desire to get to the future and away from today's problems as quickly as possible. People were blindsided by this uprising because they don't know history or they want to pretend it doesn't matter. But the forces of history are catching up with us. You want peace? You can't jail and kill or ignore and deny your way to peace. Because you're not addressing the problem. 
The problems we have today have historical roots, roots that have never been uprooted by acknowledgement and reconciliation and justice. Thank you.